Ladies and gentlemen, gits and grots, welcome to Happy Crump and Wargame. And today we're going to talk about an incredibly important part of the game, which is how do you build your freaking list? And this is something that confuses casual players, competitive players a lot. A lot of times you'll see people will bring in the most meta list ever, and they'll have no idea how to use it, so they end up doing crappy even though they're using one of the strongest armies in the game. But before we get to that, please, dear, please, I would love it if you went down to the subscribe button and you click subscribe. Hit the bell button for notifications and please hit the like button. It helps me a lot as I am trying to stay self-motivated to uh, come bring all these tactical videos to you. If you have any questions over the course of this little quick presentation, I just want you to type them down in the comment sections. I will respond to every single comment, uh, even if it's just saying, hey, love the work, uh, or even if it's negative, you know, I'll come back, I'll pop in, and we'll be best friends forever. All right, cool. Getting into it. Arcs of Omen has changed the game in terms of building list. So let us just move on through the presentation. What are the biggest changes? Well, the real big changes are here. First of all, restrictions have dramatically changed. Um, we have so much more flexibility in building our army lists in Arcs of Omen, and it's going to allow us to make very new lists now that we used to not be able to do. There is no troops tax. So if you're an army that doesn't like troops, uh, I'm looking at you, Mr. Xodes. I'm looking at you, Mr. Uh, Space Marines. You don't really need them anymore. All the Space Marines... They might actually want to take them now that they get free sticky objectives. Or GW. Anyway, um, for certain armies like your Custodes and, and everything, now that they have OPSEC back on all of their elite troops, all, all their infantry, they don't they don't need troops. So they could just, eh, no troops for me. I'll just take the good stuff. So it's really good for some armies. It has no effect on others. Um, and that's the way it goes. So no multiple de detachments. All you're getting is this one Arc of Omen detachment. Now, this is not a hard rule because Imperial forces can ally in Votan, weirdly enough. They can ally in a patrol of night or a um, auxiliary. So obviously, they can still do their auxiliary support for their assassins, inquisitors, uh, knights. They can also uh, bring in a detachment of knights as well. So you can bring in like three Helverins with your army without breaking any special rules. And so it allows just, just more fun flexibility. Uh, chaos, they can bring in demons. Uh, it's all locked per um, group. So it's like the Thousand Suns can only bring in a patrol of Zinch demons. Uh, the War Deeds can only bring in a patrol of Corn demons. And then the Disciples of Bellacor have a little kind of a weird one. That'll give you the option to, uh, what do you, what do you could bring in a unit of, I think it's House Corvax Knights without having to break your own special rules. It's pretty cool. So there's a little flexibility there. Um, so what this allows though, is it allows for super, super new bit, the list. And also the elite characters, they actually have their own slot. So if you want to run elite characters, you're not going to run out of elite slots anymore, which is, uh, much appreciated because I like to run elite characters. So that's very, very nice for me and for a lot of other people as well. All right, so in the Arch of Omen attachment, you'll have to select a mandatory slot. And what this does is it gives you one slot that you have to have an additional um, three choices from. So that can be Elites, it can be Troops, Festac, Heavy Support, or even Lord of War. What does this mean? Well, what this means is that you can fulfill your dreams of a true monster mash. You can bring Angron and three Corn Lord of Skulls, and that's a completely legal list, which is hilarious. Uh, but it's going to make some really strange lists that's going to pop up over the course of the, uh, the Arcs of Omen season, which is going to be super fun. Um, what I want you guys to do when you start writing this list, though, you've got to select your mandatory slot, and then you got to figure out, are you making this list for an individual tournament? or a team's tournament, because you're gonna build a completely different list. Remember, if it's teams, which I'll, I'll, I'll do teams in a very separate video, but if it's teams, you could have extremely strange skew list because you don't necessarily have to um, be able to play against every type of opponent since you have the ability to kind of tailor who you're playing to in, in teams. And then you get a, a note the mission pack for your tournament, right? So this means, are you playing Recover the Relics? Are you playing Data Scry Salvage? Are you playing Conversion? Because the types of missions you play will dictate what types of troops you bring. Um, for example, if you if you know for a fact you're, you're going to play Abandoned Sanctuaries, that might incentivize you to bring slightly less pre-deploy or pre-movement uh, troops. Um, it wouldn't me, but for other people, maybe it does. All right, uh, so let's just go on into our next slide here. So... Secondary choices for the Grand Tournament. Okay, and remember, I have stars here because for the Grand Tournament, <laughs> your secondary choices come from the Arcs of Omen Grand Tournament pack. They don't come from your Codex. Your Codex has your secondaries written very differently than the Arcs of Omen does. So what you need to do first is you need to identify the obvious secondary. What will you score your 10 to 15 points on? Um, for Orcs, it's going to be get the good bits. They're going to get it. 
uh, guards, inflexible commands, space marines, they've got codex re uh, warfare, demons, reality rebels, studies behind enemy lines. So you know that you're going to score 15 points on these. So the very first thing you're going to have to do is you're going to have to decide what units in my army are going to score this secondary. And that's the first thing that you build for. Um, then we'll just go on into our secondary choices. So we look at our secondary choices here. Uh, then the next part of our secondary choices, you have to identify the easy secondaries that can be map dependent. What do I what do I mean by map dependent? Well, what I mean is on recover the relics. If you're playing against an army that has any amount of troops, you're probably not going to want to use that as a time to do behind me lines. Maybe you would want to do engage in all fronts on that map because they're going to screen their entire um, backfield, and it's really easy to do. If you're playing data scry salvage, now that's a lot harder to screen, so maybe you will take behind me lines in that one. If, uh, so hopefully you're understanding what I'm going for. And then what you have to do is you have to figure out which units in your army are going to be able to score these flexible secondary options. And then lastly, you've got your tertiary secondary. Uh, and, and I'll talk a lot more about the tertiary secondary in a different video when I'm going over secondary specifically. Um, but that is going to be generally a, a kill secondary or like a psychic secondary or something like that. So then when you're building your list, the next question you want to ask is, how many secondaries do I want to give up? And this is very different for different armies. So when I'm playing my Custodes army, one of the main things I do is I restrict the enemy's choices for secondaries. So I never give up more than 10 on Assassinate. Sorry, that's a little typo. I said 9. Eh, sue me. Um, so I don't give up more than 10 on Assassinate. I don't give up more than 8 or 9 on No Prisoners. I'm den my game plan is focused on denying my enemy secondaries. But when I'm playing Orcs, I'll give up whatever. Don't care. Because no matter what, I'm always going to give up 15 on Assassinate. Um, I'm always going to give up a bunch, on, a bunch of no prisoners. My goal as orcs is to just stuff the enemy army, and I'm supposed to table them or just get so many points that I don't care how many points the enemy gets. Um, so it's a little bit of a different game plan based off of which type of army you're bringing. Also, one other thing to be aware of is sometimes there's overlap in these secondary choices. So if I give up 15 on Assassinate, do I have to care about giving up 15 on Bring It Down? No, because it's the same category. So they can only choose one of them anyway. So if you're going to give up 15 on Assassinate, take all the vehicles you want. It won't make any difference at that point because they're going to choose one of them. Uh, they're going to choose one. All right, so then we got to select our compulsory slots. So, so now that we've identified what secondaries we're trying to score with our army, we have to figure out what is our compulsory slot. Um, and this will change based off of the army you're taking as well. So custodians, for example, they have to have infantry because if they don't have infantry, they're not going to be able to raise banners, and they're not going and, and they really need those Alaris terminators for the deep strikes to get them behind enemy lines. Um, you got other options like the Ventarian bikes, but the behind enemy lines is really hard to screen for just a single model. So that's why custodians are so good at it. For Gene Shield cults, they're going to need a ton of bodies on the battlefield because they have to guarantee fruit swarm which means they need troops. So they, they're almost certainly going to choose troops as their compulsory slot because these guys, they literally can put out 10 troop units and, and wish they had more. Um, then orcs, we need bodies and speed, but they don't necessarily need troops because our elites hit really hard and our fast attack hits really hard. So we would probably be choosing either elites or fast attack for our compulsory slot. Custodians would be elites, gene circles would be troops. You guys are good. You are getting the picture. That's how you're going to choose your compulsory slot. How does your army play? Now, there are certain roles that you need in uh, your army, okay? And this is always going to be heavily influenced by the mission pack and the terrain. So uh, you, you play on a, on, a, on a tournament that has a lot of terrain very, very differently than you'll build a list for a tournament that has very little okay, terrain. So for example, if there's light terrain, uh, you might really be encouraged to have a small footprint because it's going to be very hard to hide your entire army. But if there's dense terrain or heavy terrain, then it's going to be easier to hide an entire army, and you might have a lot of bodies on the on the on the battlefield to start with. Maybe you are going to be going for um, like a green tide as orcs, and you're like, cool, I just need all my infantry. Awesome. If there's a heavy amount of terrain, you don't even have to start them all in strategic reserve. If there's a light amount of terrain, you're going to have to plan on probably starting more in strategic reserve or deep strike things like this. Um, it's also going to the terrain that's going to be in the mission pack for whatever tournament you're going to is also always going to give a layout of the terrain which will tell which will give you information about who are you actually going to be playing against so for example if it's a light terrain uh, mission expect to see guard expect to see a lot of votan expect to see a lot of iron hands these shooting armies if you have shooting galleries for terrain you're going to see shooting armies and that's going to help you determine how to build your list because maybe you're going to want to skew into countering the shooting list in that type of a terrain um, whereas in melee 
or in melee favored terrain where it's very, very lots of buildings, lots of obscuring. It's easy to block line of sight. Maybe uh, the shooting armies will have to tailor to be able to handle the melee that's coming at them. So you're going to need utility roles for each one of your units in your army. Every unit in your army has to be serving a role. Ideally, they're serving multiple roles. Roles, what do I mean by that? Well, let me explain. Damage dealers. These are the units that are going to actually hit hard and kill your enemy. Every army must have minimum two of these. You have to be able to kill your enemy. Uh, you, you just have to. Even in armies that are played non-interactively, you still have to have an ability to kill your opponent. <laughs> then you're going to need units that can hold your objectives. Now, for most armies, one to three is perfect. You, you really don't need more than three units that are dedicated to holding objectives. I would argue two is probably that sweet spot. For custodes, um, everything can hold an objective. <laughs> but it, it just is what it is for the, for the army. Then you're going to need some units that are made for scoring secondaries. So in Orcs, for example, my Gretchen score me secondaries. So I'm going to take three units of Gretchen. It's going to cost me 120 points, and they're going to score me 15 and get the good bits. It's going to happen. Um, then you need some form of anti-tank, especially if you're going to a if you're going to an individual tournament. This can these the anti-tank and anti-infantry can change based off of the opponents you're going to be meeting in team tournaments. But for individuals. You just have to. You have to have one to three anti-tank units at least. You're going to need one to three anti-infantry units at least as well. Because if you're fighting a horde army and all you have is Meltas, you're, you're kind of screwed. Then you're going to need some form of disruption. And disruption can be a bunch of things. Um, Eldar actually have disruption when they cast their um, Eldritch Storm. That is disruption. It means that you're, you're going to screw up the way the enemy deploys because they know they can't bunch together if you're going to drop an Eldritch Storm on them. Um, pre moves are really important for this for movement blocking movement donna denying and stuff so vote and have the bikes that move 12 inches and they move 12 and more inches uh shroud runners and eldar they can move crazy fast and then all infiltrators will slot into here as well so for orcs it'll be my commandos for space marines it'll be your infiltrators or your incursors these pre-deployers can really 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 mess with your opponent's ability to get to you so you have to have some form of movement disruption then a support staff what do I mean by support staff? Well, this changes based off the army, but your support staff can be your chaplains, it can be your apothecaries, it can be your captain or captain um, alternative roles. These guys are going to be buffing your army or, for, or just providing general support, but they're not necessarily there to individually kill the enemy or, or whatever. You'll need distractions. Uh, distractions, you know, the old adage of the distraction carnivax. Well, a distraction is something that's on there that forces your opponent to react to it. So if I have Gretchen on the battlefield, actually that's a distraction because suddenly, yes, it's a 40-point unit and you don't want to waste resources killing a 40-point unit. But if you don't, that 40-point unit is going to score me 15 victory points. So it's a great distraction unit because the opponent's going to be dedicating resources they don't want to dedicate to it. Um, Carnifex are great examples of these, obviously. Um, sometimes your big, nasty Bane Blade or whatever can be a distraction unit. Alpha Strikes, these are units that can get into combat turn one and really make it so your opponent does not want to deploy on the line. Um, not every army can Alpha Strike, so that's not an option for every army, but some, yeah. Uh, plan Bs, I think every army needs one Plan B at least. Uh, this is what happens when your army goes wrong. How do you recover from catastrophe? Uh, this is actually one of the main reasons I switched to Orcs uh, from being a main Custodes. It's because when Orcs, uh, say you blow up my, my transports turn one, I have a teleport spell, which can be a backup. It's, it's not a primary plan, but it's a backup plan in case things go terribly wrong. The Custodes, their backup plan is kind of like, if they have a cat catastrophic first turn, their backup plan is more or less just try to roll your involves, <laughs> uh, which is, uh, it can work, but it's, it's pretty risky. Um, then what happens, we are going to move on into our rapid reactions. You have to have a unit that's really, really good at reacting very quickly. What happens if the enemy goes in a place you weren't expecting, or they land that dead jump or that teleport that you weren't ready for? You have to have something that can get to that unit really quickly to handle the offensive. Um, and then transports, and that's just going to depend on the army as well. Uh, some armies have great transports, some armies have crappy transports. All right. Then uh, what are the pitfalls of building lists? Just because you can ally in, doesn't mean you should. Uh, I get into this discussion with people on the Custodes server a lot. Uh, they're very excited that we can bring in Helverins into a Custodes army now. Because um, like, oh, look, we have all this super good long-range firepower. And while that's true, yeah, Helverins do have good long-range fire support. 
the, the, the problem is, is that a custodes, and this, this example applies to everything. I'm just using this one to illustrate my point. Custodes are a short to medium range army. Everything they have, all their firepower is going to be 24 inches, except for like a Sagittarium. And then all their damage is going to be really short, short melee. I mean, it, they, they do their damage in melee. It's when they do it. The anti-tank is at range and their melee is, is, is their anti-horde and their main damage. So by bringing three Helvrens for a long range support, what they're going to end up doing is they're going to bring okay long range support that's going to, going to immediately lose to any actual long range army because if you put three helverins as your long range custodes and you go up against iron hands or you go up against guard your helverins are dead instantly they're huge they're hard to hide they're hard to move it doesn't matter that they can put out a reasonable amount of damage in one turn because next turn they all die anyway and then you lose a quarter of your army for essentially no reason and then they're not doing anything for you so in custodes i don't like the helverins um in other armies, maybe it's awesome that you could bring in Votan as a, as a patrol, but you're going to break your faction-specific rules, and what's, what's that going to give you? Okay, yeah, Votan are fast, and they can, they're, they're okay, but does that support your game plan? Uh, many times, we'll find the answer is no. That being said, sometimes allying is great. I actually always take a, an assassin in my Custodes army. Yes, I know they just released the new Imperial uh, whatever hand handout, but the War of the Spider, by the way, is still valid until June, so... Assassins still have stratagems. They that you can they can still have all their fun things, unless the GW releases an update saying the War of the Spider is no longer valid. Then, you know, then maybe I won't take assassins anymore. But I actually really like the assassin the custodians. I think it gives it a lot of benefit. Um, you don't have to spam the best units in your codex for orcs right now. Knobs are probably the best units in the army because they're so such a value for how much killing units they give you. But I don't run max knobs in my army. I take two units of eight, whereas some people want to go for the full 30. It, it's not a bad choice to go for the full 30, but you don't need it either. Um, just because it's the best unit doesn't mean you have to spam it as if it's not serving a purpose in your specific army. So think about what your army is trying to do. CP usage. How much CP do you need to start on? Some armies don't need any CP to function. Some armies need a lot of CP. Back in Nephilim, I wanted zero CP for my Custodes because it didn't matter. So I just did everything in Warlord Traits and Relics. But now in Arcs of Omen, I actually really like starting with CP because we can spam our strategies again. So I start with like 3 CP in um, Arcs of Omen where I started on zero in <laughs> Nephilim. Um, over, over redundancy. Not everything in your army needs to kill everything in your opponent's army. You need some units that their job is not to ever kill anything. Maybe their job is just to move block. Maybe their job is just to score you points. Um, you don't have to make every unit do everything. And then lastly on your pitfalls, we're looking at the kill power. Some units actually can be too killy. Uh, you don't need to be able to kill three big knights in one melee activation with one unit. You just don't. In which situation do you need one unit to kill three big knights in melee? It's just, it's, it's irrelevant. So you can actually... You, you can do that. <laughs> One last thing I want to mention is uh, save your points for things that are necessary. So upgrades are a really big problem for a lot of people. Uh, it's really easy to take a 70-point transport and then try to put in 20 points of upgrades that really make no difference for the game because the transport's still just going to drive up. It's going to deposit its, its, its soldiers. Then it's going to die. So you don't have to put all these upgrades on units that don't need them. So save, save some of your points and you only use upgrades when you need the upgrades. And then we have a few key points. After these key points, what I'm going to do is I'm going to list two of my really, really well-functioning uh, competitive armies. And I'm going to kind of go through the roles I assign to the units and, and the thought process behind building them to give you an example for how to build your armies. So key points. Identify how you play. Is your goal to table your opponent? Is your goal to get tabled, but you have scored so many points before you get tabled, it doesn't matter that your opponent tabled you because they can't win. Identify your playstyle because that might be a really effective playstyle for, say, Gene Shield Cults or, or even Oryx. Maybe we, we don't care about getting tabled in turn four because we already scored 100 points and good luck catching up. Um, Necrons used to be really good at dictating the flow of battle back in Nephilim. What they could do is they could just come up, hold on to three objectives, score 100 points in three turns, and then be like, cool, table me. I don't care. I've already won. Um, where other armies might have to table you. So, so days, a lot of times we have to table our opponents in order to get a decent score um so just identify how you play and how your army operates and that'll help you build your um your thought process are you a melee army are you ranged are you a mixed army if you're melee how are you going to get to your opponent well luckily in arcs of omen we have free strategic reserves that can be a great option for opening up certain melee armies and do you have deep strikes do you have uh re charges and then if you're ranged 
think about how you get to your opponent without exposing yourself. Um, Tau are amazing with this, amazing at this because they have this these uh, fire and fade stratagems. Eldar are amazing at it with their fire and fade uh, mechanisms. So think about that. All right, so let's go through these these two army lists here. This will be pretty fast, but it's going to give you a super good idea of why I built it this way, and hopefully that's going to influence your list building in a really positive manner. So an example army. This is the Orcs of Omen, and they are going to start with one CP. I've got 21 units, so yes, I give up crying them down. <laughs> I've got I give up 15 on Assassinate. Yes, I give it up. Bring it down is 11. No Prisoners is 13. Abhor the Witch is 6. Uh, so yeah, I give up tons of secondary points here, but I don't care because I'm going to score a massive amount of secondaries as well. So I've got the Runt Herd. Uh, he's a support and secondary. I, I'm, by the way, I'm not going to go through each individual unit super in-depth here. I'm just going to tell you the roles they fill and why I have them slotted in. So the Runt Herd, on some, on some maps, he's going to guarantee that I get the good bits on turn one. On other maps, he's just going to get me free behind enemy line points. So he's a support and he's a secondary. Um, scorer. The Knob on Smash a Squig. This guy is a damage dealer. Uh, proper killing iron gob he just does a bunch of damage and he's pretty cheap and he can do out of phase damage he can do damage in the charge phase which is a big deal for dealing with uh, phase capped opponents we've got the beast boss on squigasaur with brutal but cunning and the beast hide mantle this guy will kill anything he looks at he just they will die there's no option to be alive anymore um he supports by adding plus one to hit to all the beast snagging units around him he is an objective holder because he's nine wounds, which means he can be protected by lookout, sir. And you can put him in the middle of an objective. And because his base is so big, it's going to be impossible for you to touch the objective without getting within his heroic intervention range. So he serves multiple roles. He's awesome. Boss Zagstruck. Um, this guy is super fast. He deals a crazy amount of damage. And then he dies. So his job is to go in, kill an MSU unit that the opponent wasn't thinking about, and take an objective from off of their backfield because they didn't realize that he moves 18 inches and then charges. Uh... So now their backfield is no longer safe. They no longer control it. So he's going to have to change the opponent's uh, movement because the opponent's going to have to compensate for the fact that they can't screen a single model or it's very difficult to screen a single model from getting to the back lines. And it's going to disrupt their entire movement plans and he deals damage. And I should write down secondaries as well because, of course, he could be scoring behind any lines. The Weird Boy. Uh, he's a plan B guy. My, my transports get exploded and then suddenly I need to get my infantry up the field somehow. He's going to teleport him. So uh, my teleport is never like a plan A, but it's an amazing plan B. Uh, he supports people um, with those types of spells. He can add plus one attack to certain people. He gives secondaries because, well, if I need warp ritual on a uh, in a game, he can help me with warp ritual in combination with kill rig. Then I've got three units of Gretchen. These guys score secondaries. They are holding objectives, and they're huge distractions. Like I said earlier, they're a 40-point unit that you have to kill, or it's going to get me 15 victory points. So they're a huge distraction unit, and uh, they're awesome. Beast Nagas. The Beast Nagas are scoring me secondaries, and they have a bonus of being troops, which means when they get me behind enemy lines, I'm going to get free CP for that. They're going to hold objectives because they're obsec. They're going to deal a lot of damage because they do a lot of damage. They're, they got three rolls. Then I move into my elites. I've got two units of five commandos. These are the all-stars of my list. They move block the crap out of the army with their infiltrate and pre-deploy. They can deny other, the, the enemy's infiltrates and pre-movements. Uh, so they're going to they're gonna mess with my opponent's uh, pre-game movement. And then they're also going to help me move block. I can basically always lock at least two-thirds of the opponent's army in their deployment zone for turn one with these guys. Um, they can also have the ability to alpha strike. So I have an alpha strike unit in there as well. Then I've got two units of eight knobs, and these guys deal a crazy amount of damage, and they're anti-tank, which is really good. Knob with Wah Banner, this guy supports. He adds plus one to hit to literally every unit in the army. Uh, then I've got a unit of Burner Boys. These guys are a plan B, um, and they're rapid reactions, and they can score secondaries. So that while they don't deal a crazy amount of damage, they're going to pop in off of my deployment zone's table edge, and they can walk in within you know an inch of the enemy if they decide to deep strike. So they can mess with the opponent's deep strikes. I can bring them in from strategic reserve in the opponent's deployment zone. Um, they're flamers, so they can set to really screw up someone's charges with an overwatch. They, they have a lot of utility, even though they don't really deal that much damage. Then for my fast attack, I have a big unit of storm boys and a small unit of storm boys. The big unit's going to score secondaries behind enemy lines. Um, they're going to they're going to deal a lot of damage. Actually, they can movement block, and they're really fast with rapid reactions. The smaller unit does the same thing. They just deal less damage. But they're easier to, say, deep strike for behind me lines or something like that. Then I've got one unit of three Squid Cog Boys. These guys deal a lot of damage. <laughs> and they're pretty fast, so they can do some movement blocking. And then I've got a Battle Wagon with a Defrola and Fortress on Wheels. This means that it's a transport that deals a lot of damage in melee, and he's very tough. So, one, he deals damage. 
Two, he's a transport. Three, he does movement blocking because he's huge. Four, he's rapid reactions because my knobs who are inside can deploy three inches away in any direction of this thing, which is huge. So they can, I can get them anywhere across the map, basically, um, when they disembark from the from the battle wagon. I've got five Kilicons, which are one of the best units in the army now. Uh, these guys are cheap. They deal a crazy amount of damage. They're rapid reactions because you can teleport them or you can strategically reserve them. They can move and block. They can score secondaries. They can do anti-tank. They can do anti-freaking elite infantry. These guys are legends, and I love them. And they're also very hard to kill. Then lastly, I've got the kill rig with squig high tires and uh, scorch skip bones. This guy, he does a crazy amount of damage because he has a psychic face. He has a shooting face. He's got a melee face. He's exceptionally fast. He can alpha strike. Especially with those kill, uh, with those squeak high tires, he's got a 33 inch threat range on turn one if I choose to advance and charge him. Um, he movement blocks, he scores secondaries, anti tank, he's just a legend. So, this is the roles I supply to all of my units. If I, The only units I really consider in my head is like, can I cut these? Are the ones with only one role. So, for example, on this, um, one or two roles. I, I could cut the squig hog boys. I could cut the knob on smash the squig. I like having them in here, but I, I could cut those. So that's where that's how I, I go through this army. And this is a great army. It's doing really freaking well right now. I'm currently running it in a couple different leagues. I can report back uh, in a few weeks on its final results. Then my next army, and this will be the last one for today. This is my crushed Stodies. And they actually start on three CP instead of the one because they're much more CP hungry than they used to be. Because all game long, I'm going to be spamming Transhuman. I'm going to be spamming Emperor's Auspice, which basically turns off um, your your rerolls against my units. Um, so I need a lot of CP. I also need, want a lot of CP to start because I can change the Assassin that I have to suit my needs for 2 CP. So if I'm going against a really heavy Psychic army, I can change my Kalidus Assassin into an Eversor Assassin. Or if I'm going against a melee spam army, I can change my Kalidus Assassin into an Eversor Assassin, right? So I like having that CP, and it also get, and since I have Trajan Valors for the 5-up CP regen, I'm going to constantly have CP to spam my other abilities as well. So that's why I want more CP for this army. But if you look here, I give up 10 assassination points, 2 and bring it down, 9 on no prisoners, and no one on a core of the rich. Because so, like I was saying earlier, the Custodians do a really good job of denying their opponent's secondaries, even though they don't necessarily score them very well. But the secondaries I would use with this army would be things like banners, I would be using a kill secondary, and I would be using most likely behind enemy lines because they're amazing at it. So I've got a shield captain on Don Eagle Jet Bike. He's got uh, two warlord traits, superior creation and radiant mantle, so he has a five up feel no pain and is always minus one to hit. And then lastly, he's got a relic that gives two redeploys to my army, which is amazingly strong. Uh, Trajan Valoris, he's doing damage and support. The assassin, uh, if it's the Kalidus, it's going to be doing damage, secondaries, and alpha strikes. Because remember, Kalidus assassins can come in. 3 plus D6 inches away, which is which can be 4 inches. It's pretty hard to screen for a 4 inch bubble. <laughs> so they can drop right in and uh, they can really screw up your opponent's back lines really fast. Uh, for troops, I've got one unit custodian guard with two spears and a shield. They're going to hold objectives, they're going to do secondaries, banners, and they're going to deal some damage melee. Remember, and, and they're great at holding objectives because they count as two models each. They're OPSEC. And the guy with the shield actually has a zero up save and cover, which is uh, hard to shift. Then I've got a unit of four sides of harm. These are the guys with the assault heavy bolters. They do a lot of damage. They hold objectives really, really well. Um, they can get secondaries just like the custodian guard. Um, and they can do some movement manip manipulation because the sheer damage output from these guys can make it so your opponent doesn't want to walk in certain areas on the, on the table. Uh, then I've got two individual units of Alaris Terminators. These guys' jobs are for rapid redeployment because they're in deep strike. Uh, they're going to score behind me lines, so they're for secondaries, and they're going to hold objectives, because what if I just need a single model to hold an objective? That's what it does. I've got a unit of five wardens with axes. These guys deal crazy damage. They hold objectives, because they're obsec now. They score secondaries behind me lines. If they're going forward, they can raise banners in the early turns, and they're anti-tank, because they get to that critical strength eight in melee. My fast attack, I've got one unit of four Venatari. These are like the assault marine versions for Custodes. Three pistols and one spear. The one spear is there to deal a little extra damage. And they do objectives. They do damage. They uh, score secondaries. And they're very fast, so for rapid response. The Virgis Praetors, which are the bikes, they deal a crazy amount of damage. But they're not OPSEC. And so their job is they're anti-tank. They're rapid response. They deal damage and they score secondaries. But they're not really made for holding objectives, even though technically they can. Then for the last two, I've got one unit of Witch Seekers. These are the uh, Sisters of Silence with the Flamers. These girls get a pregame move, which means they're very fast. 
which is very useful. So they have movement utility. Um, they can hold objectives. And they also have the ability to make your opponent's psychic phase worse because they can't be targeted by psychic spells. So they can screen smites, which is really good against Thousand Suns, for example. Um, lastly, I've got the Cladius with the Iliastus Culverins. This is the tank with a bunch of long-range firepower, and he's very fast because he's a flyer. So he's going to hold my backfield objective. He's going to deal damage. He's going to block with movement. And he's very fast, so he can do rapid responses. So when you're looking through my army list, just look at them and, and understand how I wrote the roles next to my units. I encourage you, when you're building your list, to write these roles down. When you write these roles down, it's going to help you create a way better list and understand your army list much better. This is how a lot of the pros do it. Um, maybe not this exact stratagem, but this is this is the technique that I like to do for it. So try it out. Please write in the comments if you're going to try it out, if you have tried it out, how it worked for you. If you have other thoughts or questions, type them down below. I will absolutely respond to them all. Thank you so much for your attention. This has been a wonderful video, and I can't wait for the next one where we continue our journey on becoming better Warhammer players. And until then, happy crumping, Wargamers. All right, all. Bye-bye.